The best evidence of that is that they now sit on a superior court, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And so we appreciated their service. It was effective, uh, but brief. But because it was so effective, uh, they were promoted uh, by the president. And now, the office, once we had the certified list, uh, but the state of emergency with the coronavirus uh, prompted us to delay the selections. I was not in a position to spend hours and hours reading uh, these opinions and other writing, uh, given all that we were dealing with at the time. Uh, but particularly over the last several days, I've had a little bit more time to do it over the weekend. Um, and I'm happy today and very pleased to announce the appointments of two more South Floridians, Judge Renatha Francis and John Corial as the next justices for the Florida Supreme Court. Now, I've been in office about 16 months, and since taking office, I've had the privilege to make five appointments to the Florida Supreme Court. Four of those five appointments have come from South Florida. Uh, two of the appointments have been women. Uh, three of the appointments have been Hispanic. Judge Francis will be the first Caribbean American to sit on the Florida Supreme Court. She may be the first Caribbean American to sit on any state Supreme Court. We've researched it. We haven't been able to find anyone. Maybe other folks can look at that and see, but it's quite possible, but certainly in Florida. Judge Francis was born in Jamaica and immigrated to the U.S. After, uh, as an adult after having run two businesses in Jamaica and serving as a primary caregiver to a younger sibling. I think she'll say a little bit more about her background, uh, but I think it's extremely extraordinary what she's been able to accomplish. Um, her understanding of the Constitution reminds me of another famous Caribbean American, Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton was born and raised in the British West Indies. He rose from obscure circumstances to be the greatest Treasury Secretary in American history, as well as one of the main authors who created a strong commitment to the rule of law to, to craft. Her years of experience prior to becoming a county and then circuit judge was spent as serving as an attorney for the judicial branch, so first uh, DCA in Tallahassee. And so I think through that experience, as well as her exemplary experience on the bench, uh, she is well equipped to, to be able to be a great justice on the Florida Supreme Court. Judge Francis is married to her husband, Philip, who's here. She has two children, and many of you may see one that's very, very young, about a month old. Uh, so we, we have a two-month-old at home, and so we kind of understand and feel what she's going through. She is on maternity leave from her, her judgeship, and um, I think her uh, ascension to the court when, when, uh, in September is going to be uh, something that we're all looking very, forward to, very much forward to. So Judge Francis, uh, your story is inspirational. Um, thank you for your willingness to serve, and congratulations. Thanks. John Corial is the son of Cuban exiles. His father escaped the tyranny of Fidel Castro via Operation Pedro Pan in 1961. John replaces a daughter of Cuban exiles, Judge Barbara Lagoa, uh, on the Florida Supreme Court. And one of the things I really appreciated about Barbara uh, was how the rule of law was just ingrained in her as being something very important. And I see the exact same worldview out of John, given the family's experience. People like John, and it's particularly our Cuban-American community, they understand the importance of having a society based on the rule of law rather than based on the whim of an individual dictator. Um, and so when you go through that, when families have that, that personal experience about what can happen when law gets superseded, you produce people like Barbara Lagoa and John Corial who understand the importance of upholding the Constitution and upholding the rule of law uh, for all the Floridians and so that we can maintain a free society. Um, John's parents, had they not escaped Cuba, John's one of the talented, most talented lawyers I've ever been around, but had they not escaped Cuba, 
he may be driving a taxi cab or something. Not that there's anything wrong with that, um, but you would not have been able to realize your potential in other fields. It would have been what the government told you to do. So his parents leave a totalitarian society, come here without any advantages, but they had freedom. And so what has happened, John graduated from Harvard University as an undergrad. Uh, he was an assistant U.S. attorney right here in Miami at one of the most high-profile U.S. attorney's offices in the country, the Southern District of Florida. He has uh, been an adjunct professor at Florida International University and a very, very in the Constitution, all those things that you would want. Uh, but I think because he's had such extensive business experience, he's bringing a perspective on the court that may not be there um, in, in, in abundance right now. And they're all great judges, but I think John brings something additional, which will be very, very good going forward. He also has a list of very, very strong recommendations. He was recommended by one of the outgoing Supreme Court justices, Justice Bobby Luck. It's also highly recommended by Senator Tom Cotton, uh, Judge Roy Altman here in the Southern District, as well as former Governor Jeb Bush. Um, and they're two kids, and so John, I want to thank you for being willing to serve. You're putting your money where your mouth is uh, by giving up um, a lot of a lot of remuneration in the private sector, uh, but you you have the uh, ability to to do a great job. So congratulations to you and your family. And with that, I'm going to let the, uh, the two new uh, justices come up and say a few words. Thank you so much, Governor. Um, I'm incredibly honored and humbled by this appointment and the confidence that you've shown in giving me this tremendous opportunity to serve the people of our great state of Florida. From very humble beginnings to standing before you all today, I am truly the epitome of the American dream. I grew up in the island nation of Jamaica, the daughter to a single mom who never finished high school and who herself was only a small farmer's daughter. But none of that mattered because what my mom had and what she imparted to her two daughters was grit determination, and hard work. And those values, inculcated early and often, were reflected in me when I began my first profession, as the governor mentioned, as a small business owner in my late teens and early 20s. And for those of you who are curious, um, I operated a bar and a trucking company. And I did that for about five years. So, and I did that all while attending college full-time, eventually graduating with high honors, and being a surrogate parent to a much younger sibling. As a student of history growing up, I was and remain in awe of the United States, its constitution, its freedoms, its respect for the rule of law, and I wanted to be a part of that story. And so, like generations before me, this young immigrant girl set out to find her place in this shining city on the hill. When I embarked on my second prof uh, profession in the law, never did I imagine that my journey would lead me here, standing before all of you. And so I'm truly grateful, but more than that, I'm humbled that I get to be a part of this American experiment and to serve at the highest level of our state judiciary. The Florida Supreme Court protects the people's liberty, and part of doing that is respecting the limited role that judges play in our constitutional system of government. As judges, we exercise neither force nor will, but merely looking at arbitrariness and the potential abuses of power. If history teaches us anything, it's that as simple and enduring as this principle is, it's evaded the vast majority of humanity until this American experiment. In our great country and our great state, we're governed by the rule of law, not of men. I want to close by thanking some very important people um, in my life, without whom none of this would have been possible. To my mentors and my colleagues, you have supported me tirelessly and in the process amazed me with your generosity, dedication, and kindness. To the Florida Supreme Court, JNC, 
Thank you for all the hard work you do <laughs> while juggling personal and professional commitments and for giving me the opportunity really of a lifetime. To the former governor and now senator, Rick Scott, for giving me my very first appointment to the bench. And to my friends and colleagues, for your calls, your texts, I, I truly feel the love. A special thank you to my family. Mom, for all the sacrifices you made to make sure that my sister and I had everything we needed, even if it wasn't everything that we wanted. For your love and your continued support, thank you. To my husband, Philip, whose unwavering support and belief in me sustains me. You're a true partner in every sense of the word, and it's been quite a journey so far, sweetie, and I cannot imagine you are. And Matthew, you're a wonderful baby. Eventually, one day, you're going to see this. You're a wonderful baby, but dear, please let mom and dad sleep. <laughs> and again to Governor Ron DeSantis, thank you again for this honor and this opportunity to serve our great state. I'm truly humbled. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. You've heard it said that Alexander Hamilton said courts have neither force nor will, but merely judgment and sometimes a good audience. <laughs> uh, Governor, my prayer today is that your judgment uh, will have been good and that my judgment will not let you down. I am grateful to the people of the state of Florida who welcomed my parents to our country 60 years ago when they and their parents sought justice, a better life, and most of all, freedom. This state and this country shared all those things with my family. There is no better way to be grateful for something than to share it. And so today, in committing myself to this work, I also give thanks to the people I am blessed to serve, with whom I am honored to share my best efforts. I am grateful to my parents, who made the most of the opportunities available only here only to Americans. For my father and for his parents, that meant sacrifices I, now a father myself, find inconceivable. He, like 14,000 other children from Cuba and untold millions from other places, parted ways with his parents, trusting in the goodness of this country, coming here as an unaccompanied child. He spent six years Today, they do. And while none of my grandparents are physically here to celebrate once more how their sacrifice has been rewarded, I know they see it. A la comunidad hispanohablante, quiero decirles que el compromiso mío con la justicia y con el servicio del público es total. Y la meta de este servicio y de mi vida será El, una defensa de los principios de justicia y eh, todo lo que la igualdad frente a la ley y todo que nosotros como americanos deseamos para nuestros hijos. I am grateful to the many teachers I've had, to my colleagues at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of Florida, for my partners at Cobre and Kim, the lawyers who trained me at Davis Polk and Wardwell, the Honorable John D. Bates of the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, judges, adversaries, and educators who made me better than I would have otherwise been. Thank you. Most of all, I am grateful to my wife, Rebecca, who blesses me every day with compassion and love and to our children, Jonas and Eden, who make us happy. You make me want to be better than I am and to live up to the trust that has been placed in me today. Uh, every time we're doing this, you have so many great candidates that come out of Southern Florida, and I think that that's a testament to a lot of the great talent that we have here. I also look at somebody like Judge Francis, who immigrated to this country and started a second career. The law is her second career. She's already been a county and a circuit court judge. She grew up single mom, like they said, in Jamaica, 
was running these businesses, taking care um, of a sibling, and then comes here, works really hard, and ends up on the Supreme Court. So Caribbean Americans should know in Florida, the sky's the limit, but really anyone that comes here has an opportunity to make the most of their God-given talents, and Judge Francis is very much uh, emblematic of that, and I know she's going to serve very well. And then, you know, the now Justice Coryell, if you look, any time, uh, you know, there's um, issues with, you know, people standing up for freedom, and democracy, and rule of law, you just look to the Cuban-American community here in South Florida. Time and time again, uh, the people that are produced have the dedication to freedom, uh, democratic self-government, and the Constitution. And I think John uh, that and for him to give up the type of money he's making is uh, not a lot of people would do that I can tell you and I'm not going to say exactly how much but if you research his application I think you probably be able to find out as well it's quite a bit quite a bit of money but the willingness to serve and the willingness to bring a really top flight intellect uh, I did uh, today to be able to be here you can ask them some questions if it's out of bounds i'm not gonna tell them not to answer but you know if you want to ask them i'll take some questions as well yes ma'am <laughs> so um well the the one the case we knew was going to happen that was obvious from the beginning it, it'll go to the 11th circuit and we'll see how it shakes out there um in terms of the rnc florida would love to have the rnc heck i'm a republican it would be good for us to have the dnc in terms of huge economic impact for the state of florida we we lost out on when with with the pandemic coming and we lost out on some of our traditional events that we normally some of the golf tournaments, tennis. We had WrestleMania scheduled for April, which people don't realize is hundreds of millions of dollars of economic activity. So I think that that would be great. And so Florida, just like I've said to many people, Florida wants to work with you. If you're a business, if you're a sports team, if you have some of these events, we want to work with you to get to yes. I can't guarantee every single idea is going to necessarily be something that, that we're going to be able to do, particularly like tomorrow. But as you look in the summer and stuff, we definitely want to work. So the door is open. We want to have the conversation, whether it's RNC, DNC, whatever, because I think it will be good for the people of Florida. So I said, no, it'll go to 11th Circuit. We knew this was going to happen. I mean, it was obvious from the beginning of how this shook out. No other court in the country has held this, even the Ninth Circuit. So um, I think we'll go and then we'll see, um, uh, you know, we'll see what. I have not spoken with the president specifically on that, but um, I have, we've let the folks at the White House know that, that we want to work with them, and we think that would be a good thing to do. So, so he knows that, and I know the key people in his administration and in his campaign know that. Well, maybe Carlos has a great, uh, you know, it's like, I think it's a lot of it is, we obviously have a number of areas in our state. Obviously, Miami could do it, Orlando could do it, Tampa could do it, Jacksonville could do it. You may even have some other places that, that could do it, and I think it's just a matter of, of whether they, um, they want to do it. But these are things that go in, I mean, and the good thing about it is they've already raised a lot of money for this already, thinking it was going to be in North Carolina. So if you have a Florida committee, if it ends up in Florida, a lot of that work in terms of raising the funds has already been done, and so it would kind of be a plug-and-play thing. So we would want any of the local communities that we're interested in doing it to work with them. I'm not going to say that I'm going to choose Orlando. So uh, with the reopening, what we did was, and this is over three weeks ago now, we did the, the phase one, and we left Southeast Florida out of that initially. They were talking with Carlos and talking with other counties. So we did the other 64 counties, and I think if you look at what's happened since that started, um, when they have cases, it's almost always a prison, uh, a long-term care facility, or we're actually people into migrant communities, migrant workers, and they live in tight quarters so it can spread a little bit more there. But their positivity rate in terms of 
standard test, it's like one or two, so it's very low. Even Southeast Florida has really plunged. Uh, Broward and Palm Beach and Miami is now about 10%, and the, the tests that come in are almost always under that. Um, but then you look at the hospitals. We, we've had so much hospital space this whole time, there was never any danger being overwhelmed since we went into phase one, no change in that. In fact, uh, people that are in hospitals now, the increase has been because of the elective. Get those. So the indicators are, um, you know, we have seen a major overflow into hospitals or anything like that. And so we're, we're very, we just have, it's too diverse. I think if you've ever seen that graph of the number of people that came from New York City when they fled at the height of the epidemic, where was the number one spot they went? Southern Florida. Now, they didn't necessarily go to the pan, Florida Panhandle. They didn't necessarily go um, to, to North Central Florida or some of those other places. And so there were just unique challenges. And I felt that having you know, Miami-Dade be able to do things in Broward in certain ways without imposing a way to go. And I think that that's proven to be good. But Miami, if you look at they were over 500 cases a day at the beginning of April. Now, unless it's a data dump, a lot of these cases are prison at the prison at the um, homestead, so so they've definitely seen a decline in the um, in the virulence of this year, and that's because they've done a lot of hard work. But I think that the mayor did a, a major plan when he I mean it was so extensive, probably more than states have done in terms of what they did in terms of their. So we're supporting you know what they're doing, and I want them to be able to be empowered to make these decisions. Yes, sir. My date have gotten. Mayor Jimenez, he can spend the money if he goes to file the CARES Act, they come after him for it. All the other locals who didn't qualify, if they misspend it, they take it out of the state. So we're working on some guidelines and to make sure that, um, you know, if some city is using it who didn't already qualify for it, that they're not spending it. We're going to continue to test, but the fact of the matter is, we haven't been able to test as many people as we thought would want to get tested. And we're not going to force you to go through a drive through site. I mean, if you're, unless you're a first responder working in a long-term care facility, um, if you're just a member of the general public, it's really your choice about whether you want to go in. But we're not, you don't need to even have symptoms. If you want to go into these sites, go into these sites. It's very, very good. We're also doing more serological testing. And I think that that's a good expense to be able to try to identify exactly Carlos did this here with the University of Miami, and they were able to identify uh, the number, the prevalence, which means the fatality rate was much lower. What was the fatality rate based off how you guys calculated it? Okay, so 0.14. Remember, when the World Health Organization, I think in February, they said the fatality rate would be 3.4%. So that means 100 cases, 3.4 would be fatalities. When you look at the sero prevalence, like what Miami and Mayor Jimenez did, 0.14, that is a whole different ball game. Seasonal influence is about 0.1. Um, we're going to do sero prevalence in every other part of the state to be able to get a handle on it. But I think what you're seeing, and the CDC actually in their guidance last week, they put out a, a, a really Infection fatality rate nationwide, if you include the asymptomatic carriers, to be 0.26. Again, a vast cry from the 3.4. And if you really look at policies in some of these other states where they were sending the sick back, really, really ramped it up. I mean, if you look in the last week, we had days last week where we got 75,000 test results back. That's more than some states have tested this whole time. Uh, we got uh, yesterday, I think we got 45,000 back. 
Earlier last week, we got 55,000 results back. Yesterday, we got, for today's report, I think 20,000 results back. Uh, when we were at the beginning of this epidemic, I mean, we were getting eight, nine, maybe 10,000 a day. So we're twice uh, of what we were doing, uh, which I think is really, really important. So, but I, I hope everyone will um, give give these great new justices a round of applause. Anyone else? And we want to thank.